to introduce a very long time <laughs> friend and colleague, uh, Faisal Sami. Uh, Faisal did his PhD with me at the University of Waterloo many years ago. <laughs> More than a decade. 2005. Five, yeah, okay. 2005. Since then, he's uh, been a world traveler. He's worked uh, for companies uh, in the US uh, on uh, CMOS image sensors. He's worked for uh, Master University and Wilfrid Laurier used at the university teaching at the, about the same time. Uh, before going over, even further overseas to the uh, to Kuwait and uh, the United Arab Emirates and uh, let's say world travel. Yes. <laughs> uh, he's now back in Canada working as a, a visiting researcher at uh, the University of Waterloo again. Yes. Uh, and uh, has uh, agreed to come and uh, give us a presentation on uh, his uh, most recent CMOS image sensor work. Um, and thank you for coming on the Friday before the long weekend and uh, and uh, f for uh, supporting Faisal in his uh, in his presentation. So thank you. I, I will have Faisal's presentation and then a chance for some uh, questions and answers, uh, and uh, and then we'll wrap up. Thank you. So thank you very much, and take it away. Thank you indeed. Thanks so much, uh, Richard. It's uh, it's a pleasure to uh, see you again. Uh, you know, after uh, such a long time, but uh, we are in touch anyways. Uh, thanks everybody for coming to this uh, audience, uh, to this seminar at the uh, York University. So uh, basically the title of my presentation, and that's actually summarized my, uh, my work. So basically I work basically on extracting intelligence from biological uh, systems and try to embed them in uh, electronics, uh, that's my research, and also in teaching, in education. That's, uh, that's the other side of my, of my uh, career. So, uh, so uh, I think that's just the printed from history. Yeah. Oh, maybe uh, keyboard. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, all right. Uh, to implement intelligence, we have to define it. We have to well, know what's it, what's is it, what's in it, what what is it exactly. So it was really uh, um, an aspect of the human being since and uh, was questioned since long time. And uh, I here uh, basically get some codes, which are the milestones of my approach to this, uh, to this really exciting topic. So, for example, uh, quoting uh, Socrates uh, uh, from the Greek civilization, he said basically uh, that a quote that is really famous, he says that I know that I'm intelligent because I know I know nothing. <coughs> it's, uh, it sounds like uh, something, uh, you know, uh, not, uh, funny, but it really reflects the very important aspects of intelligence, and that's the self-awareness, which is the uh, the hot topic right now of artificial intelligence, is to make the machine self-aware about themselves. And once it's, uh, once that's achieved, things will really be totally different, and uh, the AI will take off really exponentially, and it is taking off. So let alone to uh, reach this this stage. So this is a character of human being. The human being knows uh, that uh, he's intelligent because he can reflect on that. So self-awareness is really important. Now, uh, for, forward a few centuries down by Albert Einstein, his quote says that the true sign of intelligence is actually not the knowledge, it's actually the imagination. That's the reflectance of the intelligence. And that shows the other aspect of intelligence, and that's the creativity. It will be creative. And how is that achieved? That's another story. But it's a reflection, one of the reflections of the intelligence. Uh, again, in the uh, current times, we can find lots of definitions of intelligence. Some of them that are really uh, very important in business, in engineering and stuff. And stuff like that, especially the emotional intelligence. That's very, very important. The linguistic intelligence. The analytic intelligence. So the intelligence itself has multiple dimensions. So that's what I want to reflect in here. And this multidimensional aspect of intelligence is really something really uh, mind-boggling. Why it reflects everywhere? That's another question we need to uh, contemplate. And actually, even psychologists they don't have a, a one definition of intelligence as shown in here. So the, what is really intelligence from all these? These are quoting. There are other aspects of intelligence as well. So the bottom line is that there is no consensus of what really makes the intelligence, what is really intelligence, okay? Um, okay, what's next? 
Oh, fine. Einstein, after 30 years working on the photons, and by the way, he got his uh, Nobel Prize, not for his uh, relativity, he got it for the photoelectric effect, basically describing the photon as, you know, uh, in French corpus Q. It's like an individual thing, you know, like a... He said that we don't know it's a photon, but yet we use it. We use it in the camera, we use it in PVs, we use it everywhere. But what is it? We don't know. Same thing for intelligence. We don't know the, the matter exactly, what is it, and stuff like that. We see the reflections of this matter, and same thing for intelligence. In this case, let's harness it, although we don't know it. It's not really a big deal. So for harnessing it, uh, many approaches have been uh, treated so far. The first one is the, the, uh, the most well-known uh, application, which is artificial neural networks. I started uh, this research back more than 20 years in Malaysia, where I studied the artificial neural networks until uh, recently, last year, I presented a paper on that. So this is basic, based on the heuristic processing capability of the neural networks, okay? Which is part of the brain, basically. We are trying to mimic that intelligence of the brain. And that's been used and it's been used. There are many topologies of, uh, you know, neural networks and etc. So that's one of the applications of or harnessing intelligence. Harnessing means biomimicry. Okay? Now, the second uh, definition or the second approach to harness intelligence is basically based on the brain. The faculties of the brain, they are really multiple. The brain can sense, can control, can process that the, the, the information of the sensing and as well as the control, and can do also something really amazing. Extracting ideas or intelligence or knowledge basically by looking at the environment and try to extract some knowledge out of the physical world. This is basically math origin if you if you think about it. Okay? So the brain can do stuff, many stuff, not only one. And this integration of functionalities, that one dictates the the intelligence, is the, the functionality integration too. To integrate many things in one single box, in one single box, and that's what makes a phone I, or the iPhone intelligent. I for intelligent because it can do a lot of stuff, okay, in a single device. So this is a. Uh, and by the way, uh, back in the days when I was a student with Richard Ponzi, our group was uh, called the Integrated Camera Group, right? And that's basically because we try to integrate functionalities on the camera. It's still going right now. Okay, uh, now, <clears throat> I'm not going to read everything, so the, uh, the other aspect here, oh, okay, here before we uh, move here, so, so basically the intelligence also is used to know how this, how the world is, is doing, so this is not really application, it's just a thought, okay, about how really intelligence is made, the last application of intelligence is to extract information, and that's basically for security application. When we say we gather intelligence, we are actually extracting information from the data. So the extraction of information is also one of the applications of intelligence. Okay, <clears throat> having said that, uh, back to, again, Greek, to get some inspiration about the intelligence. Uh, uh, who is this? Uh, so basically, Aristotle said something really amazing. He said that nature does nothing uselessly. Everything has a purpose, everything has a use. And uh, here another quote which I really admire by Kepler, okay, who is a great uh, German mathematician and astronomer. He said the diversity of phenomena of nature is so great and the treasure is hidden in the heavens, so rich precisely in order that the human mind shall never be lacking in fresh nourishment. So still, there is tons of intelligence around us in the physical world as well as the biological world, okay? All right, good. So we will go from here. So, what we know and what we need. What we know is that intelligent design and biological systems have passed the test of the time. They have been here for millions of years and they survived. That means they can actually solve multifaceted problems of the, of the life with, the, with, with that aspect of intelligence. Now, what we need, what we know also, or what we need is to also, as engineers, to, fa to face multifaceted problems as well and we need intelligence to do that, okay? And one of them is imaging. Imaging is one of the engineering topics and origin disciplines. They have these, uh, you know, constraints that are from different ways, from different aspects, and they need to be solved. And that, we need intelligence to do that. So this is a solution is uh, provided by nature, 
in biology or elsewhere. And here we have problems in engineering that we can solve. And they, both of them, they share the aspect of tackling multiple problems at the same time. And why not get this for this and for that? Let's get biomimicry going with, with the imaging. Okay, and for that matter, I define or find <coughs> this, uh, this uh, name artificially intelligent imaging or AI square. AI square basically is like AI square, which is the power formula for the, the heat that gets uh, dissipated from resistors. What we mean by that, so basically we are trying to get the uh, power of the intelligence down to or implemented into electronics. We we'll go very quickly uh, because some of the uh, things that are deep and uh, specialized in imaging, I will not really uh, get, uh, get you bothered with that. But I give you this, just a perspective of that. This is uh, overall the picture of the uh, an imaging system. It starts by the scene, passed by the optics, get focused by micro lens, filtered by the uh, RGB filters to get the color of the image, and then converted that light into electrical signal digitized, processed, and then enhanced, and bingo. So it's quite a pipeline of information from the optical domain to the digital domain, okay? So this is basically the anatomy of, of a, a, a classical oscillator sensor, okay? All right, and the things that are being done nowadays is that we implement more and more, you know, even uh, uh, figure recognition, things like that on the same chip, and that's what we, care about, what we call system on a chip, that's where really the intelligence of the image sensor is going right now, and uh, the future is really uh, without limit in this area. So this is just uh, basically a picture, uh, a micrograph, uh, uh, a microelectronic graph uh, of the picture. So basically, uh, an image sensor uh, consists of a sensing area, a control area, and a sampling area. And of course, you have the different, uh, you know, signals, input, IOs, basically uh, analog and digital too. I uh, get this uh, the image out of other chips. Just uh, you know, uh, an introduction about the application of our AI square formula. So, to implement uh, the uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the artificial intelligence imaging, we have approached it in uh, three ways. Two ways I approached in my PhD long ago, but lately I, I endeavored into the device level. So the system level, and for that we are going to uh, try to biomimic the intelligence of uh, uh, biological vision at the system level. For that, we have uh, fabricated and uh, successfully tested and published, of course, papers on pyramidal CMOS image sensor. The second one, AS square, but at the circuit level, when we say at system level, basically at the chip level of how to acquire the data. At the circuit level means we are digging down and trying to play at the circuit, at the pixel level in this case, but we will approach it in a spatial domain. And the last, which is the current research, is to approach that device level. All of these, they biomimic the visual, uh, the biological intelligence, uh, biological visual system intelligence in, why, uh, in one way or another. We will go really fast because the time will not allow to go in details, but here I give you the summary of that. So for the system level, so basically we tackle, we try to acquire the image in the time domain, basically what we do, we basically try to enhance the dynamic range which is the ability to see basically bright and dark spots of the imager in a forbidden manner. I will show you that in a second. So to design it, we approach it in, in, this, in, in this way. So basically we keep the active pixel sensor, basically the circuit of the pixel, which is the standard pixel and uh, CMOS uh, image sensor pixel, okay? While changing the architecture, basically the global architecture about how to sample. And from that we fabricated and made and uh, designed this CMOS uh, image sensor, we call it pyramidal, and we'll see in a second why we call it pyramidal image sensor. So quickly, again, so this is the classical image sensor array, okay, it's a matrix, where we read row by row, okay, and uh, as we read, we build the image and then we transfer it along. This is the raster scan, there is nothing new in that. So we took that and we make the one-dimensional row sampling we twisted to make it a ring sampling, okay? And by doing that, we gained lots of things, of course, you will see later. This, because, because the image, the, the eye does not necessarily work like this. This is, was extracted from, or was used from the display technology, about the, uh, the old TVs, basically. And but this is more into the two-dimensional way of sampling of the retina, okay? 
So here we take ring by ring, okay, the, uh, the image, and then we lead it out through these buses, the oblique buses, okay, uh, surrounded by the central and hot circuitry. Okay, good. So let's let's go very quickly into the details there. So this is basically the uh, just a snapshot of that. So this is basically the image. This is the real chip. This is the pyramidal image sensor. So it's like you are looking at the pyramid from the top, and that's why we uh, use that uh, that name. And basically, these rings you can see that they are surrounded by these eight banks of sampler hole because they receive obliquely the signal of the rings, which is now divided into eight segments. And eight segments that at the same time they send the output outside the chip, which makes the speed actually technically eight times. Okay, than the classical image sensor. So this is the thing, and that's it. And this is the, the pixel inside. Of course, it depends where you are in the ring, but more or less the shape is the same. Now for the diode, coming back to the last scan. So basically, what you do, you read row by row, and then you go back to the row, first row. And when you do that, to have same integration time for all the pixels, and the picture will look uniform. Okay. Now, to add to that complexity of the pyramid, we put another raster scan, another uh, change for the scan. And basically, we call it bounce. In that bouncing, so basically you read, this is just one, uh, one eighth of the image sensor. Basically, we go and read ring by ring, okay? And then as soon as we reach the edge, we go back bouncing to the first ring and so far and so forth. In this case, we give each ring, we'll have two integration times and we'll have two images in this case. Let's see. What's the outcome of that in the view? This is basically the mathematical extraction of that. I'm not going to waste your time. With that. And that's where I want to take you. Okay, good. So the, uh, the blue here, or uh, the purple, I don't know. This is the integration time for this image. And what does it mean? The integration time, this is one of the bouncing. This is the, uh, I, I, I called it uh, the outward bouncing because uh, I'm reading now bouncing from the inner ring and going out, okay? So this is the blue, and the red one is bouncing where well from the inner ring. So bouncing at the inner ring, at the outer ring, and then going inward. So as you can see, you get two images. So basically, one which is the blue the here. So the integration time is so small here that it becomes almost dark there. So it's brighter at the periphery, as you can see. You have enough time to get some uh, signal, and the opposite comes to this, which is oh to the red. Sorry, that. So it's brighter in the center because the integration time is large enough, okay? But it's shorter at the outer ring, why? Because the integration time is small. By combining the two, you get a uniform integration time there, and you get an image in here. But there's a catch in there. When you combine two images of multiple integration time, the dynamic range basically enhanced. And that's the nice thing about it. The dynamic range basically get enhanced at the synthetic one, and it's an enhancement, so it's not optical dynamic range because we made it. And actually, when you take a photo with your image at night vision, it asks you to keep it still. And that's the reason is because it takes multiple exposures and build it, so it's artificial. And this is one of them, but this at the ring level, it's not at the chip level. So the dynamic range enhancement looks like this. This basically shows the ring order. This is the inner ring and this is the outer ring. This is basically a 64 by 64 pixel. So we have a 32 rings, okay? So as you can see, the dynamic range is very, very much higher in the inner ring and decrease, 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 and then increase. Of course, here it goes to zero by because the, the time did not change. The integration time was the same for both of them. And if you remember the, uh, the intersection of the previous graphs, you found that up here, the integration time was the same for inner or outer ring. Okay, good. What can we do with that? This is the, just a 3D of that. We can play with the integration time and make that border to the end here. And guess what? You get what we call a forgetted one. What, what do we mean by forgetted one? We'll get to the phobia in a second, but it means something just that the dynamic range is enhanced much, much better in the core than the periphery. And why we do that? Because when we look straight, that's actually the highest resolution of the image uh, acquisition of the biological system. That's the optical axe. And we'll get to that in a second when we talk about the biological vision. So now, the dynamic range enhancement is like that. So, so what is the dynamic range is like that? That's a good question. It gives us the opportunity basically to allocate <coughs> the analog to digital converters more bits in here. If you convert the dynamic range into bits, you get higher bits in here than there. So basically, what does it mean? 
I can allocate less resources to the periphery of less importance, okay, and keep higher, uh, you know, higher resolution for ADCs for the inner brains, okay? And that's the idea because the biology does not give resources for vision all the same. No, it has this region of interest, ROIs, that only ROIs, they have the highest attention, highest resources in terms of processing and sampling, okay? We'll get to that in a second to see the proof of that. Okay, good. Now to see the, uh, it's unfortunate is that the CMOS, uh, we use here a CMOS point 18 technology, at that time it's not uh, uh, adapted for, for uh, the imaging. Huh? Of course, to make it for imaging, it was by TSMC. If you make it for uh, uh, optimized, the quality will be much better. But in any case, I can show you, for example, here, when we take the inward scan and the outward scan, combine them, get half, half of that, we get a diffused image here, and this is the rolling scan in there. By comparing them, really, we get a nicer spot there, showing that it could resolve this, uh, uh, this uh, bouncing scan much better at, uh, at the center than the, uh, than the rolling scan, meaning that the dynamic range enhancement here is really valid. The same thing can be said for the second one, of course, the optimization was not there. But to, to add more to that, we found that something really interesting, which makes that architecture very interesting, is that for a sample image sensor, <coughs> the distribution of the noise is basically mostly in columns. For reasons we don't want to really to, uh, to get into, because the audience is not for that specific area. And you can see when you do the Fourier transform of that, you find that there are really high peaks here in the cardinal, in the x-axis. Now, for the parameter imager, because the, uh, the, uh, the output bus is basically oblique, the, uh, the noise is basically oblique as well. And the distribution now is not only in the horizontal axis, but also in the oblique axis. So what? We know from biology that, that the human visual system, as well as the most of the uh, biological visual system, we have less uh, perception of you know, uh, noise or uh, we have less pre uh, perception of edges in the oblique here than the cardinals in the 0 and the 90, basically the cardinals, the axis here. So if you basically, if you take for example, the, I think it was Sharp or a company, they took 500 of natural scenes and they made the Fourier transform of them average. They found this, this thing, you, think, you see the bandwidth of the noise or the, uh, the edges is higher in the uh, cardinals, the horizontal and the uh, vertical, but it's less in the oblique, making what? Making the pyramidal imager basically less perceptible for noise in here. So basically the pyramidal imager makes that noise less perceptible and therefore it doesn't exist for human eye. Which is really a nice thing about that, that aspect of noise distribution. The second one, the second approach of AI formula is basically at the circuit level. And for that, we played with the time for integration time, now we play with space, okay? So the sampling now of the image at the pixel level now, we try to play with that to do something. And that is, we don't treat all the region of the image the same importance. They are not all region of interest. Only those who are, who we choose to be, we sum them at the highest resolution. And that's basically the philosophy of it. So how we do that? So basically we keep the standard, uh, the standard sampling architecture, which is the raster scan, and we modify the structure of the APS to basically program the region of interest and choose which one we like. And for that, we designed a chip that we call multi-resolution CMOS image sensor. <coughs> that, this one had issues at the, uh, the technical level and uh, we did not pass all the, uh, the final characterization, but I have to explain the idea just to show you uh, how, it's, uh, how it's made. <coughs> and by the, uh, basically, a few years back, I found a, a, a I found a patent, I should have referenced it here, by Micron, and they took this from, uh, they took the idea here and developed it further from one of the SPIE conferences, and the idea is the following. We have the matrix of the pixels like that, okay? Now, if we are interested on region, or region of interest, any, any region of interest, we keep it at the highest resolution, which is the resolution of the pixels. But the areas that we are not interested to get its highest resolution, what do we do? We brush it. We take the average of those pixels. And to do that, basically we create two averaging mechanisms by embedding in the circuit, we'll show you that in a second, 
by embedding in in the pixel charge sharing circuitry, okay, to sh to share the charge of the pixels both at the, between the rows and between the columns, like painting. Painting like this, you paint like that. So you get the what? You get the out. And that's what's the inspiration of doing that. We can see that uh, circuitry in a second here. So that's uh, so again we cannot really go in details because lack of time. Of course, we have a photo dial. We have uh, you know a, a shutter a transistor there, and we have these four transistors that play the game of doing the row averaging and the column averaging based on our program. We program the areas, and what we can get from this? Oh, we get a few few stuff. This is simulation of average time. Of course, I like this picture not because only. I admire this guy, but because his moustache, the famous moustache, has highest resolution, right? I need his moustache, I like his moustache. So these are the different things that we can do with this uh, architecture. So this, in this picture, we basically row average squarely everything around his face. His face, you can see, it's good. And that's why you don't have a problem with that, because that's where your interest is, to see his face. What do we bother with the periphery? So why we can sample it at the highest resolution? And that's the idea. So this is one uh, straightforward foveated uh, image acquisition. Now the second one is random. We can basically randomly select which area we want at highest resolution and go average anything else. Of course, we can have not only one, we can have multiple fovea. So basically, where is that? Ah, here, in this case. So here in this case, we took this fovea and we took his gamut at highest resolution. So we can multiple that. And actually in biology too, in uh, one type of the hawks I read about, they have not only one phobia, they have two. And uh, when we read about it, it's basically because the hawk, uh, he is trying to, you know, chase a rabbit or any, you know, prey. So they need to see their flight as well as their prey. Okay? So for that, the biology gave them, you know, two phobia, the highest resolution, the prey and the safety. So, which is really something unbelievable that the uh, biological vision is doing. That's not only the, the only thing that we are going to face in biological vision. More. Now, also because we are able to program the kernels to, low, to lower the resolution, we can basically minimize the distortion. Because basically, if we do the averaging perpendicularly to the, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the contrast, we can basically not touch the, the contrast information at all. In any case, this is uh, just to say that we can basically enhance, we can compress the image without deteriorating the quality of it. Back to the biology. Ramon Kajal, long, long ago, he touched the retina here. He opened the retina and he tried to understand how we are acquiring the image. And he found basically across the optical axis in here, he tried to look at the distribution of photocells. First of all, in the retina here, in the retina, we have two types of photocells, and they are here. Huh? We have the uh, the rods, which ones? Uh, the columns and the rods. Okay. The rods, they are color. Uh, the the, uh, the the cones, they are color dispersive. That they can't the de uh, uh, they can't discern or can distinguish between colors. But the rods, they are color blinded. That's number one. The connectivity between these photocells and the ganglions, which are the neurons that are responsible to take the uh, electrical signal from these photocells, which use the electrochemical tra transducing to get the electrical signal to the, uh, to the uh, visual cortex, they have different, uh, different connections. The roads, they have one-to-one -one connections, <coughs> and uh, the roads, they have a many-to-one connections, okay? This is another aspect. And this basically, takes us to the distribution from here to distribution. The core, the rods, okay, they have a very interesting distribution and they basically are very low in density until we hit the optical axis, okay? And they go exponentially high. Why? Because the highest resolution. They are the best in resolving the color as well as the light information. The rods, on the contrary, they are higher on the periphery and they go down. For front side illumination, basically, as I said, basically we have the photo dial on the bottom, and on top of it we have all the uh, you know the wiring and stuff like that. On top of that we have color filtering and 
the micro lenses to enhance the fit factor and the sensitivity of the photodiode. This is the old technology, still in use, but in low, uh, low end uh, applications. Now, later on in the early uh, 2010, the backside illumination technology comes, and basically the light is now uh, basically should be actually on this side, okay, because the light comes uh, in, in here. Or basically, no, because the chips they are uh, flipped like this. So now the light, the, uh, the uh, wiring and the oxide between the layers of the uh, front, uh, front end CMOS, they are not really uh, hiding the photodiode. So the light comes right to the photodiode, and that's why it's backside. So you use two chips, and the, the sensing chip, where the photodiode is, will take that light, okay? And uh, from the bottom, basically, you can wire bond and things like that to make uh, the uh, ROIC read, uh, read out IC for the image sensor. Uh, now, in the CMOS, it, it went also in a very interesting development, and that is from 2D to 3D. The classical uh, FAT, uh, it's not shown here, I'll show it in the next slide. So, it's used as a planner, it's a 2D technology, there's no question about it. This is the standard. Planner CMOS, where we have the source of drain, okay, and we have basically the uh, source of drain, and we have the gate, and it's actually 2D. Now, as you know, it's an old technology now with aggressive sub uh, micron technologies. Now, the gate, I mean, the channel itself is a 3D, so no more 2D. Why 3D? Because again, the real state of the shrinking technology is getting really smaller and smaller and more expensive to, to waste to increase more functionality in it, okay? So, so both CMOS technology as well as the CMOS imaging, they went from 2D to 3D. And if you think about the uh, imaging uh, technology, it's basically photodiode is, they are trying to basically integrate the light in the vertical direction rather than the horizontal direction. Why again? Because we want to enhance the resolution. But by doing that, by shrinking the size of the pixel, what happens? This is basically the uh, standard APS, Active uh, Pixel Sensor. These are the, by doing, by increasing the resolution count, increase the number of pixels, uh, stuff like that. By increasing that, what we are doing, we have to decrease the pixel size. And by decreasing the pixel size, we compromise the image quality. Why? Because if you think about a, a pixel, it's basically like a bucket for the photons, okay, where you do the photoelectric effect. As the bucket decreases and shrinks, the amount of rain or water inside that bucket decreases. So basically you compromise the, the image quality. The biology does not do this because the biological vision does do things different way. So the idea now is to decouple, really, the resolution count requirements from the pixel size. <laughs> and this is what the biology has done long, long ago. Okay, but how can we do that in our technology? So right now, what we do? Okay, because the photo cells, as you can see, they see the light, they sense the light on the direction of the light. They don't sense it in the planner. They say it, sense it exactly along the, the the path of the light, and they can actually sense even a single photons. Okay, which is really amazing. Okay, so what can we do? Let's put put the photo diode like that shape. And make it like this. We get basically an N type or P type, whatever it is, and the other semiconductor around and make a pillar. And that's an idea I, uh, I started actually think about it at the end of my PhD, but never had the chance to basically realize it until I traveled around the world looking for money and opportunities to do that. So when I touch the semi empirical equations uh, of the sensitivity of the pixel, again, this is uh, referenced in a paper, I can show you that. I found that the sensitivity of this type of photodiodes is very interesting. It's actually proportional to the height of that pillar. And while writing that paper and finished, I found amazingly that brook frogs and uh, some kind of fish called the Haplochromis bordoni, I don't know, it's maybe Italian fish, I don't know. What they have, very interestingly, that the photocells, they actually elongate when they have the light low and they contract when they have the light high. That basically the biological visual system, they actually contract, they, they control the light, the height of the photocells to basically play on the sensitivity. When they have enough light, they contract. When they don't have less, they elongate. 
And of course, this cannot be for any value of h. Of course, it has a validation range. And that's what we are doing right now on fabrication as well as simulation. So this shows the proof that yes, the silicon can do the same like the biological photocells. And that's where the biomimicry is. We can build the photodiodes that can have its sensitivity proportional to the height, which is something really interesting. And one more thing, the photodiode has the smallest footprint that we can do, the smallest in terms of technology. We cannot go beyond our limits. But then the only gain we can control is the height, which is, which is more or less a limit. Now, because we are dealing with photodiodes, and photodiodes are not only for sensing, they are also for converting the energy of the light into power. That, using basically the, uh, the uh, responsivity equation and the sensitivity of photodiode, we proved also in a recent paper that the responsivity of a photovoltaic cell, based on, photo, on this, uh, on this uh, pillar, uh, photopillar uh, diode, is also proportional to that. So the height, that means we can enhance the conversion efficiency by playing on the uh, height of the photodiode. And why the photodiode in, the, in this quadrant of the IV characteristic of the diode, it works as a sensor. <coughs> but if it works, but we, if we put it in this bias condition, we are in photovoltaic. Because why, at the end of the day, we are using the same photodiode more or less, okay? Some crazy ideas we were thinking, and still I'm thinking, maybe in the future if we are lucky, is uh, basically uh, uh, make an imager that on top of the layer, on the top of the imager, we harvest the light to power the ROIC underneath that using the, the, uh, the uh, pillar, the narrow photo pillars, to acquire the image. So we can use the same structure, of course, more or less depends on the fabrications, okay? Uh, and we can basically have a batteryless similar image sensor. It's very, very interesting. And we call that uh, concept a sensor busting because we are sensing and harvesting that like the uh, power. Of course, the applications are wide, especially for wireless endoscopic imaging, in which basically it is most stringent. I work on this in my master, basically, and it's the most stringent application for this kind of uh, technologies. Why? Because you need really to consume as, much, as less as you can the power, and we need the highest resolution. So all the odds, they come here to make this pill, and it's still available in the market, but the technology uh, development there is endless. And of course, the phone, uh, camera phone images, they are one of the hottest applications for this technology, as well as automatic to name you, okay? All right, uh, a, a team in uh, Berkeley University, they work on these pillars as well, in different perspective, and uh, they uh, published also uh, some uh, of their findings there but in a, in, a different, uh, in a different way. But it shows one great aspect of the uh, you know, pillar for the diode. Basically, they ca you can bend them, basically, and have a bending uh, PV cell, which is really uh, give a boost for wearable technologies, okay? Uh, so again, with this technology that we suggest, we are trying to get the benefit of the front side elimination technology, which is a cheaper technology compared to backside elimination, by modifying the devices, so basically gain, getting the cost of the front side elimination with, with the quality of the back side elimination. Okay, this is uh, basically finished the first part of my talk regarding embedding intelligence. Now the second part is regarding the education, which is something that we should work, we should really give importance for our future generation. And for that, I suggest to embed intelligence in the education system. If you go to this talk, you will see what I'm not talking about. So basically for this, I, I took the first definition of intelligence, which is the self-awareness. Education, to embed intelligence in the education system or uh, engineering education specifically, we need to make the self-awareness a very important component of the teaching. And that embed uh, experiential learning, uh, embed uh, uh, project-based learning, etc., etc. All of these techniques of teaching, they play the role of putting the student as a self-aware uh, entity to make it intelligence, to learn, and to be self-driven. So the dynamics of education, as I said, is basically, it's, uh, it's not straightforward. It should be student-centered, student 
uh, factor the uh, uh, teaching methodology and for that we have to encounter or include the psychology of the students okay we uh, have to blend the bring different modalities in learning and especially we have to make all of this around this self-awareness aspect which uh, really very important for the teaching of the students I'll show you my experience in a second but before then I uh, have to tell you about the STEM engineering uh, the Amis about that STEM science technology engineering and math curriculum was started in the project by uh, President uh, Barack Obama uh, back in 2009 and they poured billions and billions of dollars there uh, which is uh, something fascinating I just came from uh, an American Society of Engineering Education conference where I published uh, my findings there and you cannot really imagine how much the industry and the, uh, the academia are working to, uh, on this STEM curriculum and what is this STEM curriculum? basically to embed basically multiple disciplines especially these disciplines uh, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math in the education system of the of the students. Okay, and I did that in uh, in this uh, in the course I was teaching in the fundamentals of microelectronics in the UAE, basically by embedding basically lab work in the class itself. Not to waste the class, but I do shoot the lab experiment. Okay, and I bring it to the students. But before that, I have to prove to the students mathematically the the thing that I want to prove with my experiment. So this is one of the applications of STEM that I endorse. So basically why we do that? Because one way only of learning is not enough. You have to approach the learning in different facets so that to convince the students of the importance of the thing they are learning. Okay? And why we do that? Why we do that? Why? Because artificial neural network, one of the aspects of artificial neural network or applications is called the uh, content addressable memory or associative memory. And basically that the memorization that we use in our everyday life basically we get different inputs and we associate them to remember them okay that's in a nutshell okay so one of the architectures i was working called bi-directional associative memory basically it basically associates one layer of information to another layer through the synaptics okay that you can program them using any rule i used at that time heavy rule and how to implement this in the class. So basically, before the class starts, I have to embed the STEM in the presentation I'm going to give the students. And then, these get recorded. Okay, of course I have to present in the class, and I record my class at the same time. Okay, and then when the students, after the class, revising, trying to understand or redigest what the student has learned, basically it associates the moment of learning with the video that is the student is watching. By doing that, the aha phenomena or the déjà vu phenomena comes and enhances the learning process of the student. And that's where the associative memory basically. We associate the event with the picture that, or the video in this case, inside the brain of the students, and that's how we enhance the recall process of the students. So this is the uh, neural network aspect or the artificial neural network aspect. I ran uh, multiple uh, really, uh, evaluation uh, pre and post exams, like for example this one, the preterm exam of this methodology we call it AIM, and after the uh, uh, and also before the final, and just ask the students this uh, question: uh, How they like that this blended learning, uh, blended learning in the sense of the class and also the video, of course, they are all published in, on my YouTube channel and most of them, really, most of them, more than the class, they, most of the class, they find it like very useful or useful, so almost 75% they agree with that, especially when, you, when comparing the final to the midterm. Why? Because the final, the amount of things they need to remember is huge and any blended learning that can enhance their recall is much appreciated and you can see this, the blue and the red, which are uh, basically be very useful and useful. Sorry about the uh, solutions, not uh, that great. They are higher than in the midterm. And then when I ask them also as well, which resource they start to uh, uh, they, they use for revision, all of them they start with this. They use the PDF slides. Why they use the PDF slides? Because it's the low, the highest depth of information. Okay, because they can grab, they finish in very quick 
fashion. Now, the second one was the textbook. Like, if that's not enough, they go where? To the textbook. And it's the same profile, by the way. And if not enough, they go to the YouTube channel. Why? Because it's long and dilute to a great extent. Anyways, I published uh, these findings and I uh, have other analytics on my YouTube uh, channel. And uh, here I quote some students, some nice quotes. So at the end of the, the, the course, they, they gave this. So, uh, like for example, I want to read everything. I read the last one, which is <laughs> the one I really like. Excellent teaching. I don't. The course was interesting, even if the class was at 8. Indeed, we start at 8 in the morning. It was fun with learning. The only class, we don't feel sleep, which is really a great uh, thing to read about this technique that it has uh, uh, really helped the student that much. Again, to conclude, the biological intelligence systems, they are really uh, available for us to learn and to embed in our uh, engineering as well as education system, okay, to improve the, uh, our education and the level of understanding for our students. The psychology <coughs> of students is a very important aspect of learning. We should not take it as uh, lightly and we should factor it in this regard and that the intelligence has different facets in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in life, especially for education, the self-awareness aspect, very important to make, to let the student to reflect on their understanding. Uh, okay, and of course, by using various ways to learn, especially like, for example, STEM technique, we can enhance the understanding of the engineering and science uh, courses as well, and blending different modalities, digital and in class, is another aspect that is really great for the education. Thank you so much for uh, attending this rather lengthy seminar and uh, welcome all your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We have any questions? Sure. So is, is this the, so I'm curious about the YouTube channel. Is this how you re normally record Yes, the class? that's right. Yes, that's how uh, I, I used to borrow a camera from university. But then I found that uh, the mobile phone has a better camera, so I discovered I use mine then. <laughs> it's much better and more efficient, yeah. Why do you think they don't use that? The video. The video. If you look at the, your statistics, mm -hmm. your, your PowerPoint notes, yeah. the PDFs, was the yeah. most helpful. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, the slides are, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't have it. Yeah, of revision again, you know, they are smart, the students. We are smart. If you want to revise and you want to finish the revision in a very quick time, where do you go? You go to the most dense source. But then, when you are, when the student is stuck on learning one aspect, then they have to run. Where? To the more details, textbook. Then where? To the video as well. So again, it's just a matter of, you know, how much we can digest in how long. That's it. So they have to, to finish quickly, they start with that dance, and uh, go further. But it definitely it helps. And it helps, why? Because the students, they reflect that. And uh, they even, there's an interaction component on that, they can even send me, they watch the video, and they basically scroll where they got stuck, and they basically leave me a comment below about it. And they receive that comment automatically by email, and they go there, I click on the time where they have put their comment, I click on it, I go there, and I read, I understand their question, and there I uh, reply. And that reply will not be only for them, will also be shared by others as well. So it's a very interactive and very useful way of teaching, especially students when get stuck. Because that's better than saying, oh, I remember, uh, sir, uh, you said this and this and this and this. Uh, the professor maybe is too busy to remember. I uh, maybe agree or more, not agree, but when there's a video, oh yes, I mean that and that, and the video is there, and it'll be shared by everybody, which makes this technique really quite interactive and very useful for students. That's actually an interesting point, isn't it? You can, you can go and identify the point in the class that is causing the confusion. So, so, so maybe what you need is some kind of, because you said the, the problem is the density of information, right? Is that the, yes. that is denser in the textbook than it is in the video. So maybe what you need is some kind of indexing. 
This is that's true. like that. That says the little table of contents or something for the video. Yes. That enables the students to go to where they want to go. To. And yeah, that's that's uh, actually uh, thanks for uh, putting that. Actually, that's the next plan. The the best. I mean, to finish this uh, project is to go basically. I know the curriculum. I know what I passed. What are the elements? And the only thing I need to do, which which in fact I did it in one of uh, my talks. I go in the comment and put the time when each aspect we were do uh, talking. Uh, okay, so and they, uh, the viewer can click on the time and automatically go to that aspect where we start to talking about. And definitely that's that's very useful. It will be much better enhancement of, of the video, of the videos as they are right now. But that's the next step I am planning to do, of course. So I, I'm thinking of recording my lecture, but doing a slightly different way. And that is during my PowerPoint presentation. Uh -huh. I have a microphone. Okay. It gets recorded at the same time as the PowerPoint presentation, and you can output a movie of high-res version of your PowerPoint plus audio. Uh, that's good. You, but is that a Camtasia thing? No, that's uh, Keynote. Okay, so we record it at the end. Yeah. yeah. No, there are there are yeah, different things. On the, on the different. Yeah. But why I like this rather than this, I, I, I like the idea as well, but this one, I really want the moment of the learning. You know, students, when they attend the class, they try to put their psyche and their selves in the mood of concentrating, I'm here to learn this, you know what I mean? And the visual you know, interaction between this, the teacher and the students make that bond of learning stronger. And when they watch that in the video, it becomes like, hey, me, I'm living that moment again. And that's the recording process, which is another dimension, not only the content itself, but the uh, human interaction between teacher and students, it, it really boosts the, uh, the recall and the understanding process way, way uh, further. I move too much. I won't be in the camera. <laughs> you know, I, I so, the, so, so the, the issue here is that you both have two ways of, or we both consider two, two sources of information, the audio and the visual, but you have a different idea of what the visual is. Right? You, you're, you're, you're yes. visual you're going with the slides, yours is you, and, yes. and, and the slides. And the slides, so yes. So what you want is three, in fact. Yes. Um, so the more you put that... I will be creating the uh, PDFs on my PowerPoint, plus the video. Yes, you can. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering why you just also the audio by itself, so people on the bus can listen. I don't know. Yeah, it's a podcast. Yeah. But the generation that we have here, students, they are on the go. I mean, we need to give them the courses at their hands, you know. They are bonded by mobile. In fact, I got this idea starting from Kuwait. I, so I was teaching physics, by the way. And as soon as I give them break, as soon as I say break, they start mobile. <laughs> it's just, they are so bounded by the mobiles that they became problem for me. Sometimes even asking students not to use their mobiles in class. So I said, why fight in the mobile? Give them the mobile. That's it. You see? So really this, this will help the students further, you know, in their learning. Especially, uh, you know, with the amount of information they have, it's good to give the course to them on the go. That, that would be a good refer you to, to, let's say, uh, a Locally? Really, it's, uh, it's, uh, I, I don't have really preference there, but uh, locally is good. It depends uh, what's your target, really. Right. For me, I wanted really to show and my technique support. of teaching everybody. And, and what your local support is. Exactly, yeah. This YouTube is. And the reason I ask is uh, there's some copyright issues, and to what extent do you want? Are you giving up copyright when you put it on YouTube? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, if it's uh, common knowledge, if it's uh, common things, I, I think the, the slides are mine actually, I, uh, it's uh, to 95% they are mine, I do them myself, so it's me giving others to, to use. I agree, there's copyright issue in, between private and uh, make it public, definitely, but in terms of teaching technique, uh, it doesn't matter really, as long as, they, as soon as they have access to that, it's okay. And of course the support, you do uh, have a uh, lots of uh, support terms of image processing, you know, comments and things like that. I don't know if it's local, then why not? So I was just going to simply put it on our, uh, on one, our one terabyte uh, Office 365. Yeah, why not? Point students do it. Yeah. And I do like this business that the students can, can time index the bit that's confusing. Yeah. And we're going to be able to rewind it. That's quite powerful because yeah. quite often I find on, um, 
exams or whatever, quite a bunch of st number of students regurgitate the same wrong thing, mm -hmm. um, which is often like not, <laughs> well. There's a number of there's a number of possibilities, but one is that that something you said yeah. was confusing. Yes, um, and it's useful to be able to get back to that. Maybe yeah, it is. Which I actually thought of. Good. Thank you. The moment, thank you. Yeah, the moment, the so learning moment there. is very important. It's also great for TFP. So the question is, can you dis... So the question, we're going back to what do you present in your movie. Yeah. It'd be quite interesting to see how far you can... By eliminating various things, where do you get to the point where it's useful? So, so all of the different elements you can record or present, and the ways you can present it, which are the most effective? Can you cut out the picture of you talking, like John is suggesting? Yeah, yeah. And, and compare the results because it might be you're right that, that in fact That's seeing you gesticulating is, is a helpful part of the a helpful part of the process. I see reason for it. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, it's uh, uh, really to have the evaluation on these techniques. It has to be clinically done mm -hmm. because it's uh, you know you have to uh, especially when it comes to quantization of the uh, learning uh, aspect. It's very hard to do it like in every day, but if you do it clinically and uh, you uh, you try it, it's, it's, that's how it should be really evaluated to be specifically. But really, from my general understanding and interaction, I think the uh, the teacher is a major component in the learning in the learning process because <laughs> just just watching the slides <laughs> or hearing him, hearing is just an addition. It's very good, but also the gestures the. Uh, the interaction, that's very odd. As much as you add to uh, that moment of learning, you get that to the students, it's good. Sound, video, you name it, whatever you can. And you give them PowerPoint beforehand? Uh, I give yeah. the slides beforehand, yes. Yeah, okay. definitely. Uh, uh, because at least to prepare them. And really, yeah. the idea is actually to make this further, is to do the flip classroom. Yeah. I could not do it at that time right. for many reasons, but the idea is to give this to students and in the class solve problems. I'm just curious who makes this. Ah, <laughs> I bought this from a different company, Walmart, and this one I bought it from where? I don't know. Okay. But they were bought uh, separately. And you need a, a power brick. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so the other, the other way, way that some of our colleagues are doing this is addressing the issue of density is to do these very short videos. Yes. Uh, and so James, for example. That's right. Um, he, 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 um, identi he, he identifies a particular skill or, yes. or technique or, or yeah. recipe or something. Yes. And he does a five minute video that says, if you want to do this, watch, watch this video. This. Yes, yeah, and, absolutely. And that seems to be really good. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, not so much the main part of the of the, of the course, yeah. but elements of things that people need Absolutely. to do. Absolutely. Particularly, uh, I guess, in, in certain operating system environments or something like that. You know. To do this, to... Yeah, this is very similar to Khan Academy, for example. Khan Academy. Yeah. Yeah, very similar to that. So basically, uh, and I'm, I'm using that to teach my, my kids. Mm. All of them. From grade 2 up to grade 8. So, Khan Academy is that is specifically, you can click on specific aspect Watch it, right. and then do the solution and uh, tackle the problems. Right. It's very, very, very nice. Right. Although his mainly his, his picture is not there, but his voice there and the, the board is there. But it it, it does boost. Uh, really, all my kids they love they love it and they enjoy it. Because in a sense, a lecture is just a, a sequence of these parts. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. So for me, it's 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 quite bad, huh? You know, any of the earphones, big earphones. Yeah. I could be anywhere in the room. Well, that's good. And, and that and technology transfers it through. It transfers it through to the you should, Have you talked to JIT about this? Because JIT's uh, trying to do the same thing with his version of the, no. you know, the, new, uh, the new iOS 11. Okay. Um, and so he's having some problems because it's not doing it's not doing all the parts he wants it to do. But he's he's trying to use this thing for the product. Okay. Not so, so have a chat with JIT. But I like this idea too. Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's interesting. So that's just a power. Yeah. yeah. That's uh, just for power. Yeah. Yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice little uh, yeah. stand, isn't it? Yeah, I was looking really. Uh, I had uh, tried one before, 
and uh, it broke after because. Uh, yeah. But this one has, does not have the mechanic. It has the rotation thing. So uh, that's why I got it. Yeah. And this is basically selfie stick. This one. This is selfie stick. Nothing more. Not really. Selfie stick, and, and that's and it. And so. you stick it in. Yeah, yeah. That's it. There's a screw there that yeah. you can screw in there. That's it. It's gone. So you can, you know, when you're walking around, you say you're walking around too much. You take the selfie stick. Yeah, that's it. Oh. Or, or you have a helmet with a kind of, <laughs> a kind of armor. Oh, and then you look right to it. <laughs>